Emily. I'm here in Prague uh, for DEFCON 4 and this is the second day um, of the conference and here we have today a very amazing panel um, of guys from Shaspa and two of them are actually from Sydney and amazingly we've got Vitalik here with the panel as well. <laughs> Subscribe to him along the hallway. Uh, so um, today's just going to be a very um, uh, uh, informal sort of uh, chat about um, Ethereum 2.0, now it's called Serenity. Uh, the, uh, yeah, just a quick overview uh, for five minutes um, for a non-tech audience to dumb it down to a level that anyone can understand. Um, so just to start off with, uh, did you want to tell us a little bit about uh, what, you, um, what you do at Shasper at the moment, um, Adrian and um, Paul? I think there's a name change to Serenity now. Oh yes, oh, yes. <laughs> that's so right. moving away from <laughs> uh, So, so we're, we're building an implementation, a client of, of Ethereum Serenity. So we're, um, we're building it in Rust. Uh, so we, we uh, look at the, we'll take the specification that, that comes from uh, EF Research and the community, uh, and then we, we build that into like a working piece of software. So it's kind of uh, the same as uh, Parity or, or Geth. It's just a similar piece of software, but, but for the Serenity protocol, not for the present protocol. Okay, great. Yeah, so last night I actually met these guys at the Eth Grant dinner and had a very great explanation of um, what Shaspa um, is in a, in a very simple manner. Would you be able to share that um, with the rest of the world? It oh, looks probably oh, the best shouting, to answer that. I'm um, sorry, it should be shouting now. <laughs> no, like basically, there's been a, a lot of different kind of ideas for improving the Ethereum protocol that uh, we've been working on for the last four years. Many of them are kind of fairly radical and require fairly big changes to the protocol. So one of them is uh, replacing the proof of work in mining in, uh, as the consensus algorithm with a proof of stake. One of them is using sharding to, uh, so basically not requiring every node to verify every transaction, requiring kind of different groups of nodes to verify different transactions as a way of um, allowing the system to handle many more transactions. And then there's also kind of a lot of different uh, smaller efficiency improvements and the idea with uh, the Serenity spec is to basically take all of these ideas together and make a kind of new blockchain sort of spec that you know, the team from White House and uh, several other teams are in, in the process of implementing and that will uh, eventually become the new Ethereum. Great. So basically, Serenity covers a whole heap of different um, upgrade, oh, I guess technological upgrades such as sharding and eWASM and uh, proof of stake. Mm -hmm. um, is there what, what, what am I missing anything? Okay, so those three are the main mm -hmm. sort of aspects of um, of what Serenity covers. So um, how how in terms of efficient in, in improvements like sharding, like how how much like what's the magnitude of, are we talking about in terms of improving the transaction sale saleability? Mm -hmm. In the long run, potentially a factor of a thousand, but like I could also see it taking quite a bit of time to get there. Cool, great. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been a lot of talk about layer two um, solutions like uh, state uh, state channels and plasma. Mm -hmm. um, how does that um, sort of integrate into the, sh the, the sharding um, aspect? So layer two solutions are kind of a fundamentally different category of solutions from layer one solutions. So think of it as like layer one solution is kind of making the highway bigger or making more highways. And the layer two solution would be that like you would have big, like those big kind of two-story tow trucks that you would have like ten cars fit inside, so you would have more cars fit in the same space. And like obviously, if you have more highways and you have you kind of pack cars on top of each other in these big trucks, then you can have even more scalability. So the two do kind of multiply with each other, but they are kind of different ways of trying to reach similar goals. Wow, that sounds like a very great analogy. So basically, it's it's scaling in different methods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, and um, anything else you would like to add about uh, the roadmap that you're talking about this morning, um, getting to um, to actually launch? Um, what what sort of time frame are we thinking about here? Any ideas? No time no. frames. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> well, from us, uh, we're doing the client implementation. Vitalik's with doing the spec, so he's still going to kind of finish that spec. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think the rough rough time frame I think is going to be late 2019 to order of kind of thing is what we were mm -hmm. thinking of in finishing the client or not finishing but at least having a some kind of prototype or test that. Yeah, right. presently right. where the, the the implementations are all kind of a siloed where we're all working on the base logic uh, and then we're looking for March next year that we can start to connect these implementations together and start to form the like a the basic blockchain. It's, it's not going to be useful for people and their dApps. Uh, but it's going to be uh, the start of these like disparate pieces of software talking to each other and and forming this this proper network. 
Um, so yeah. as always though, in, in any software development project, especially an ambitious one, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to create time frames. So. Yeah. Cool. And yeah. I'm hoping to kind of stabilize the spec kind of much more, maybe, maybe almost completely for the parts we're focusing on now by the end of the year. But then that's, um, I mean, the spec like obviously needs to kind of stabilize before all of the development can finish, right? And that's like, even a time where it makes sense to start getting the clients to start talking to each other. Great, so the point is that you guys are working really hard to make Ethereum scale really up to a thousand times magnitude, and that's, that's basically a work in progress. So getting to something that's non-technical, a question I had for you, Vitalik, from um, a friend of mine from um, another podcast was, um, how do you actually um, make F have val Ethereum token have value? I mean, so first of all, the Ethereum token clearly has a value because it's on the market and you can buy, you can only buy it for $197, but like, if you, the, if the question is how do you, what, economically speaking, like, why does it have value, then, I mean, there's, I think, like, different kinds of sources of, uh, of, of utility. One of them is that if you have ETH, then it's, it is this kind of main, main central currency of the Ethereum ecosystem. And so there's a lot of applications that accept it. There is, uh, and it's usable for, mm, like, uh, for collateral, for escrow, for payments, and like a whole bunch of things, including a whole bunch of layer two protocols. And that by itself is a, uh, a huge kind of utility. And, and it is also a cryptocurrency, so it's potentially useful as a currency even outside of blockchain ecosystems. Also, there is this value that if you have ETH, you can use it to pay for transaction fees. Yep. And like that should not be underestimated because right now, I think possibly even yesterday, the total US dollar value is a, a value of transaction fees that have happened on the Ethereum blockchain crossed $200 million. Right. So it's like yeah, that utility by itself is also very significant. And with proof of stake, instead of uh, that value going to miners, that value will end up basically going to ETH, to ETH holders that choose to be validators. Right. And so the uh, having ether also kind of gives you access to becoming a validator and getting these uh, st uh, staking revenues so it's a combination of all those things great so it's a good point to have like multiple factors of fundamental value drivers so that's that's mm -hmm. good to hear um, that ETH would, would have, have some um have, have some fundamental value mm -hmm. um, my question is that uh, recently i've heard that some people have been talking about web3 and um the Polkadot and Web3 sort of side of things. Do you have any thoughts about, um, you know, uh, the different philosophies between Ethereum and um, the uh, Polkadot sort of uh, interoperability type of um, concept? I mean, one of the major differences is probably governance with like all of these projects trying to go for this kind of explicit, tightly coupled on-chain you know, like coin voting governance. And that's something that we're uh, kind of avoiding and we're taking this sort of more traditional governance approach closer to what you see with you know, things like Bitcoin or Zcash. Um, I mean, that's not to say that we don't have coin votes at all, right? Like we've had carbon votes, we've had votes that are kind of used as signaling to approve some con controversial protocol changes, but they don't have the same kind of role where, you know, everyone knows that is the one thing that decides. Um, otherwise, I mean, the, um, as far as interoperability goes, like interoperability is definitely a kind of very specific use case and obviously an important one, though there are, kind of, I mean, there are different ways to do it. I think one of the, like, so for example, one thing that I know Cosmos is doing is that they're trying to kind of more explicitly get like their validators to like also basically be directly aware of what the consensus of other of other chains is saying and in that way you can kind of move tokens across and kind of have and have more consensus back and forth whereas in the with the ethereum blockchain i think we care more about sort of keeping protocol consensus fundamentally very simple which means that we can't do that directly we would have to do that indirectly say by having a white clients of other chains inside of the ethereum chain as smart contracts and that does mean that Ethereum could potentially be somewhat less good as an interoperability chain, in which, which is fine because you know, if there are different niches and different niches existing is good, but and it does also have the advantage of kind of increasing simplicity and reducing risks and reducing kind of political governance overhead. 
Great, thank you so much for that. Um, basically, um, the, mm -hmm. the focus at the moment is like on the technical aspects on privacy and just scalability mm -hmm. and um, uh, and um, uh, oh, sorry, I can't remember the third feature, but interoperability, e wasn't, yeah. e wasn't, but the, I guess the um, the interoperability part will probably be coming down the yeah. track. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much for the panel, guys, and um, especially for Vitalik for um, five to ten minutes of his time. So um, yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.